the first way I wanted to start this was uh, I had done a reaction video to you. I kind of wanted to get your thoughts of what I went over there and and see what your thoughts were of some of the things that I said that may have been wrong. One of the things that irritates me most about when people do videos or uh, stories, articles about me is when they've gotten things very wrong. <laughs> and I'm like, that's not even close. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, um, I had over the, over the decades so many people writing stuff about me, publishing stuff about me, especially when I was a tattooist, I was speaking almost none to the press. Yeah. I was like not posting much on social media. I was very hidden back. And most of the stuff was like very ridiculous in my eyes because you know, I know how the world works. It's a lot of like, you know, the weird stuff travel far. Mostly the stuff who is not right travels far. Yeah. So when I saw your video, a lot of people sent me the video. And um, usually I don't mind so much people reacting because that's how the world works. And usually I like the idea to not react on people's reacting to me. Yeah. To not beat them more but I watched the video because a lot of people was say it's pretty good and stuff and I watched it and I could see that you kind of made some research or let's say that you probably know me since a longer time and a lot of the stuff was pretty accurate and I would say very respectful in a way because you're not like just guessing you always say like it's all I mean it's all tales and all is just rumors and stories and as long as you don't know it directly from me You don't know shit. Like with my fingers, there's a lot of theories about, but because I never ever made any official statement, it's all rumors. Yeah. There may, may some rumors are more right than others because some people know me a little bit better. And when people know me a little bit better, I guess their rumors are a little bit more to the writer side than to the wronger side or something, you know? Mm -hmm. But so, yeah, I, I think it was a pretty nice reaction like pretty nice thoughts on how like my ideology of life works. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things I try and do with the, uh, the reaction thing, like I, I started these just reacting to people's tattoos because they were asking me, hey, what do you think of this? What, whatever. And I didn't really, like I don't love doing those small scale things as much as, because there's some really interesting people out there that I feel like have been portrayed in, like a bad way or like a negative or kind of cheap thrills sort of way. Like we're just trying to make money off clicks and show off the freaks and trot out the weirdos and have a laugh and then move on. I'm not really into that. Like I, I've been where I live, I'm weird. Now that being said, I've always thought I'm pretty moderate. Like in terms of what's out there, I like to get tattooed and I've got, countless hours under the needle and like 35 sessions booked right now. I'm probably never going to stop getting tattooed. But for me, it was like I'm into tattoos and piercings. I never really went off too, too far into it. But I easily could have like I always have the desire to kind of keep doing more with it. And I tempered that a little bit. I feel like I've, I've brained myself in a little bit because I still want to I still want to be a part of society that I've known to some degree. But that being said, like I, I have a deep admiration for the idea of going farther than that. So I, I want to show off people who have in a positive way and kind of portray the humanity there and not take cheap shots and, you know, try and get clicks that way. But I mean, oh, how far you think this is, you think you didn't go that far. I think you go much further than most of the kids these days, just because they tattoo their full face means shit to me, you know, because I think tattooing is a journey and you earn certain spot. And you had a point, I would say similar than my wife. She had her full body tattooed, but I didn't cover her face. Yeah. I mean, I put something in her face, so she made that line, but I think she have a pretty face and she's still a normal model and stuff like this and I like to keep it like this also as at this point like where she's or where you are it doesn't matter anymore if you tattoo your face or not there's a lot it's, of pressure you 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 far that in that journey that it doesn't matter anymore you know you don't need to make a statement to anyone else or to yourself 
And I have the feeling a lot of these kids, they start directly in their face or like this, oh, I want to be the tough fucker. But they aren't, you know? Yeah. They, they, they didn't have the journey. And when you like you, you know it because like tattooing your fucking entire body a couple of times, that's tough shit. Yeah. That's a journey. Uh, I was there, you was there. There are not so many people there to really have this experience, how far to push this, you know? And for myself, just tattooing someone's face doesn't mean shit, you know? It's nothing without the investment otherwise, I think. Like, you have to... Like, I, it would be two hours of work for me to do the rest, you know? Like, I'm not worried about two hours of work. I put in five hours a week, like, every week, forever. That's fine. It, it's more of a decision that I didn't want to do it. But there's a lot of people in this community, and even on my... Uh, my reaction video to to you, I had people saying, you need to tattoo the rest of your face. Like, you, not not you should, it was you need to. I get that pretty often from other people in this community of like, why haven't you done it? You've been covered multiple times. Like you're working on your, your third body suit, even though I don't really like those terms so much. I feel like that's arbitrary because <laughs> it's, some parts of me have been tattooed 20 times. Some parts of me have been tattooed five times. You know, it's, it is what it is. Um, but there's a weird yeah, I think pressure. It's a, it's a very thoughtful process. You know, when, when I, I tattooed, like my, I started covering a lot of my old tattoos, made my first suit, very traditional with a lot of really good tattooists on me. Hmm. And then I started my third layer was like the more blackish layer. And my face was the last thing. Um, even when you see my face before it went black, it was still like fully covered. At some point I had so much in my face. I had this, this tattoo in the front, like this Thai script thing where then everybody got it. So we pelled mine out, like we just pell it out mm -hmm. and to keep my front more clean, you know, because I like the idea to have a clean front face. Yeah. And then we put a gray layer over my face because I was at this point, my body was 100% covered beside of my face. I like the idea to keep my face like still that I can interact with more normal people. Then they still have the face to, to hold on, but I still want to be covered. So we put a light gray in over my entire face. Mm -hmm. And it was still so hard for me to let go from my face, you know, from my born given face, because it was still my last hold to, to interaction of normal people. But I, I'm not sure if, you know, I see people like you and I can tell you for most people out there in society, it makes not such a big difference if they see me or you. Yeah. You're a freak. I'm a freak. We yeah. both are stamped in the category freak. Yeah. They not cross the line. Because I have a lot of friends or people here, they look like you. They just hold on the last very teeny little bit. And because of here, a lot of people look even more radical. They feel like they are the normal ones. But I think when they go out in society, I think there is not such a big line between he is a little bit more freak than him. I think they stamp you and that's it, you know. You're kind of. But it's okay to, to hold on to this. I did the same for very long and I think it's a very good process. It's the opposite of what a lot of kids do these days, which they regret their face tattoos, they laser their face tattoos. And I think this harms our culture because. It needs more people who are 100% dedicated behind and not regret any of the steps because they, they go through the process yeah. and not go the other way. Then they go to the media and that's the stuff who travel further in the media. You have the same with eyeball tattoos. They are like, I don't know, 10,000 eyeballs tattoos without any problems. But the three people in the world who go to the wrong purple, make everything wrong, 18 year old, have no experience. That's why they give a shit to who they go. Yep. That's the stories who travel through the world. It's, and that's the stories who impact our culture. The negative trends harder. Anything bad, any any horrible story. Like you won't hear about the 90 good ones. You won't hear about the, you'll hear about the one bad one every time, right? It's, I see it. Yes, but I. I seen it when I, I've been on social media now. I was unknown when I was doing my first bodysuit. I did most of that before I was on social media. But when I got on, into like Instagram and stuff like that, doing the blackout tattoos. Um, and I was covering a lot of really good work. I had five or 600 hours of really well put in, thought out work. And it was angering people to see, like it was pissing people off. And that's where my account started taking off because 
a lot of people hated seeing it. And that hate would push it farther. Like people disliking it, it, it was almost like I was growing because of that. Like it was interesting to see because like I was, it was almost like I was being incentivized to do things. Even though I wasn't, I could see someone without a very good head on their shoulder um, going through something similar to that and not knowing when to stop that or not knowing how to dial that in because there is sort of a currency in, in going too far or uh, doing more than you actually want to do. Like, say you get a really good reaction for doing something extreme and then it's like, oh, well, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do more. Than I'm going to go farther, you know? And then it's like, did you really want that? There's a lot of currency and likes for a lot of people these days and uh, follows and stuff like that. And I feel like it leads people. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a big problem we have. You'd see like this, this black alien and some people's like this. And I don't see the motivation for themselves behind, you know. I was going to ask you what you Pushing it to a him. degree where it gets, where cross the line of it's really not healthy anymore. You make changes on your body, which you suffer something later on, like... You know, I mean, I, I, I not want to say everything I do is healthy, you know. Bec I not want to say everything you do bottom up wise is healthy because putting that amount of ink in the body, it's 100% sure not healthy, you know. It, it's not, you know. But there is still a line where you, 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 you cut down your lips, you can't talk proper anymore, your saliva runs out, you chop off your nose, your immune system gets weakened because you not have the filtrage from the nose hairs and stuff like this. It's crossing the line of you make something you on a long term harm your body. Yeah, very, very hardly. A and I think interesting line between body modification and body mutilation, right? Like uh, people ask. Yes, I mean, I, 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 I probably the very one of the first ones known who was play very extremely with that line. Yeah, but. It's all it's all not so easy. Like you know, my fingers. There was a nine year thought process behind. It's nine years. It's not like, oh, this is cool. I won't do this. It's a very long time in my mind how playing with that border, see how, how far I can push it to a degree. I'm an artist. I use my hands. That's where I make my living. That's where I make my creation. That's my life. You know, playing with that line, but still in a point where, you know, I can live my life in a healthy, good way. And I think that is where the line is. What is mutilation and modification? Do you I think, never cross um, the line of of mutilate my body to myself. Uh, do you think that you doing that inspired others to do it? And do you do you think um, it would have been better if no one had have known? Since you you like you said, it's going to hurt some people more than help them to do that. I'm not saying you have. You know, the thing is that, that a lot of the extreme stuff I I made, I took forever till I published it. Like my fingers. I, I, before I officially made a statement, it was like a long, long time before it happened. People say, I never can tattoo anymore. In that time, I made the third dimension, the 10 people's piece. I made a lot of really big, crazy work, would travel around the world. I made already with my finger chopped off. Yeah. But because I never made a statement or show it to the world. But at some point, people's come here, seen it, you know, world travel at some point and then I was at some point made a statement yeah because I I wanted make some sort of a statement which was there very brief but still with good intent to show this is like a thoughtful process like but I mean you you always inspire people in a good but you always inspire people in a bad you know I've experienced and a I made of that some work myself. like we made this um, the death of Chris we called it it was one of my best friend We have a black bodysuit for me and Gerhard Wiesbeck. He's one of the closest friends from him and me. I made a lot of crazy ritualistic stuff with him, like really crazy shit. And he's a very strong-minded person. And we had the idea to make his back piece as fast as we could. So we made him a back piece in 74 minutes. <laughs> like 100% coverage. We, we still miss the design, but like everything what was like skin, we put light gray in to just have 100% coverage. We planned this six months. It was the four of us who made the 10 people piece. We, you know, we, we meet here for a week. We build a special chair. We build like everything. We invented kind of techniques. I prepared before to, to learn techniques, how to work fast through a piece, to, to not just bang this, 
And then it comes to the healing part. We made a, I made, I'm very known for making big tattoo work to push the limits in a time. No one made that crazy big work on people it's in that heavy sessions that close to, and uh, the healing is such a big process. That's why we here have our own guest house. We have control over the peoples that they not go off two days, make party or whatever, have an infection and have a bad healing because the healing of heavy sessions is equal important than the sessions itself, you know. Oh. Everybody these days can take a big magnum, put a, a rotary machine on full power and make heavy black. And then the healing, we've seen a lot of horrible healing and people have a long-term effect, have scars like in the L here inside where they can almost not bend their hand anymore, cannot bend their fingers. And this is horrible. And when we made that big piece, you know, that was one of my best friends. He slept in my bed for a few days. I sit with him in the bathtub to clean him. I fight with him about the blanket that he cooled down, that he freeze, that, you know, he not start. I mean, he had fever, obviously, after doing something like this. Yep. You know, this process, it's what people don't see. And you publish a picture. People don't see this. They aim to make it. From his back, I... I made a small documentary on my channel six years after we done it. And in the six years, we never published anything from that because I was so scared that all the people who start copying not only my style, but also the, the radical sessions behind. And I was scared they tried to like be faster mm -hmm. just for the sake of being faster and harm someone because of the healing, you know, because what it takes to heal an entire back piece you do in one session. Yeah. And for us, it never was, we want to be the fastest people done a back piece. It was about what is the limit? What, how far we can push what's possible with the machine, what's possible with the human mind, with the body. And for this, it was no need for us to publish it, you know? It was no need to, to show the world, hey, we are the toughest fuckers. Yeah, it was enough for you to know. Um, I was going to say, uh, like I, I seen some stuff, it wasn't to the same magnitude, but I was doing some, some goofy videos for a while where I was, I was putting shit through my huge septum. I've got a 22 millimeter septum piercing and I was, I was kind of, um, having fun with that, put my finger through there, putting carrots through there, put like fucking around, uh, open, openly admitting, just having a laugh. But I seen some people that were following me who were trying to stretch their septums really, really quickly. And there was a guy who actually ripped his septum. Like he ripped the tissue. And I kind of didn't want to do that anymore. I didn't really want to show those videos as much anymore because I felt like I had some kind of an impact. Like that, there are a lot of people aren't ready to do those things the right way. They're not going to take the time to heal properly. They're not gonna. They're not gonna listen to the words I'm saying. They're just gonna see. They're just gonna see the picture, right? They're just gonna see what you can do, and then they're gonna race to get there, and it's gonna be a nasty result. Like this guy's nose literally ripped at the at the bottom. So yeah, I mean that's the that's the point. Then people, there are enough out there. They want to be cooler, tougher, more hardcore, and they 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 trying the stuff without the knowledge behind and without the time it requires. You know. You can't stretch a septum or anything that fast because it harms the body. It rips. It doesn't work. Yeah, you got to be. You got to take it slow. And there's a lot of people that just want the result without the experience. Where for me, and I and I'm positive it's the same way for you. I don't even have to ask. It's more experiential. I don't even really care what I'm getting tattooed. I just like getting tattooed. I like the experience. I like healing. I like the lifestyle. I like all of it. I always have. I don't necessarily care anymore whether we do some red on my blackout or put some white over something or whatever. It's more about, I just want to keep doing it. I enjoy it, right? I enjoy the experience. I enjoy the things that I've learned through it and what I've built with it. But it's less about image now for me. I don't really care what it looks like so much anymore. Do you feel so? Yeah, I mean, at some point... I always, when people ask me, what's your concept? And like, you know, my concept is that I lost the line. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm struggling. It's, it's at some, at some point it goes to a point. I mean, I, I not have a full blackout, you know, when you look closely at my suit, it's like, there's a lot happen because I, there's a lot of gray also inside because I had, I had like 150 sessions with monks in Asia. So a lot of traditional tattooing on me. At some point I, 
I start filling everything what was white from the monks. I start letting the monks on the black and I start, you know, it's the experimental side. I never was like, well, it's cool to be black. It was just, you know, I got tattoos. I wanted a suit. So we had to use a lot of black. And at that end, I was, okay, no, I have my full body tattooed. But as I was getting very good with making body suits to people and to have two nice looking sleeves, a nice looking front piece, it's not a bodysuit, you know? Yeah. And so I try to some sort of give myself a suit, which reflects more what I do. Also, for me, as the tattooist I was, it was very important for me to push the boundaries because that was my art. That was me. And I cannot say I done it because of this. I, I think it's an interactional loop. The more I pushed it on myself, the more I was able to to find other people, to push them, to guide them, to to loop because they got inspired, they got motivated, they they see what's possible, how far you can take it, and they, they trust you. You know, they trust you on a different level. And for me, it was always like I hated the idea to be one of these tattooists who have no tattoos. You know, what is your intention? Why you are a tattooist? Seems weird. For me. This is a fucking lifestyle. There's so much more. I have no damn respect for any tattooist who is not covered. I'm very old fashioned. Here I'm silent. We don't tattoo faces, hands, necks. You have to earn this. You have to have a bodysuit for this, you know. Be very strict with all this stuff. My, all the tattooists I teach, the people who work here, they was go even, you know, they really had to earn this because I, I, I think it like this. When I teach someone tattooing, I teach him not only the hand, the, the, the craftsmanship. I teach him the philosophy. I teach him how to interact with clients, the, the sessions, the personalized, maybe, yeah, what means ritualistic? Every, everything can be a ritual when you make it a ritual, you know, when you make it personal, when you make it that it's more about than just how the piece looks at the end, you know, that you say, we want people have a good experience who come here. That's why we are not in a city, why we are so far out. Because I spent so many times on temples getting tattooed and I understand the journey is such a big part of it. A special place is such a big part of it. It's the mindset. The, uh, and at this point, I realized you, you have to pass this on to the next generation of tattooists. And they got their full body covered and then they, they wanted their hands and I let them wait for very long, you know, because I was think with them, I'm extra strict, not because they're my students or they're my friends. Because I know that is an experience. They will understand them more that it's important to let the people wait for the good things. So it's part of the journey and we are, we are pushing it there. And I think that is a problem we have now that a lot of the tattoo artists out there, they think it's cool to tattoo someone's face, someone's hand. Because like you say, it gets more attention on social media. Yeah. But what is your intent to get more, more intention on social media? or to give someone a good experience and a good tattoo. And I had a lot of talks with tattoo artists. I see why you post this even. It's a tattoo this size. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like when it would be somewhere else than in the face, you would not even make a picture from it, you know? Yeah. And it's your then you say, yeah, but it's in the face. And like, yeah, but what you are, you are artist and a craftsman and a tattooist. Then you care about the tattoo and not about the placement, you know? Point. And yeah, no, I, what I it is, you know, then <laughs> at least be honest and say, yes, I'm a fucking media slut. That's why I post it. But they aren't, you know, I have more respect for people who are just honest, at least, you know, it doesn't mean I like it, but at least they are honest to themselves and to others. And I respect that more to people's, you know, cheat to themselves. Yeah, Instagram, TikTok, all of it has become just about getting the cool trending piece. It's really cheapened the industry to some degree, but I think it's built upon uh, a world that prizes aesthetic a lot more than uh, experiential or um, the journey of things. Like you were saying, the journey, I really think is the most important part. I, I manage a tattoo shop um, and a lot of people come in here and they don't even know what they want. They don't have any idea what they want. They just want the experience. They just don't know how to say that. Like you could talk some of these people into getting just about anything. It's, and I feel like it's because people, people think they need to like the image that they're wearing that they, they don't really care so much as long as it looks good. 
But I think people are looking for an experience and they don't know how, they don't really understand that. That idea that when you get one tattoo, you end up getting another tattoo or all of a sudden you have a sleeve or a back piece or whatever. I think it's people like the feeling a lot more than they think they do and they don't plan it out that well at first. Like the thing is probably this is right with a lot, but also the more something go mainstream, the more it gets fashion, you know, fashion change. You will see, I, I bet with you in the next five years, it already starts. Lasering is getting like very big. A lot of people get stuff lasered off, especially on visible spots, you know? And I mean, in my eyes, this is the fault of the tattoo artist. You know, you have to understand Or it's hard to say. I'm very long in that game. I seen a lot of stuff coming and going. And to understand this is a trend now, also to be more tattooed and visible spot, like it's cool. Point. We all know this. It's right now very cool. But that doesn't mean it's cool in 10 years. And that's why why you 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 want this experience cool. Get a tattoo wherever on your body, you know, where you maybe you don't regret it because it's somewhere. It's not mutilate your life and it's then it's an experience because the kids they have it on their arm and they like yeah that was from my wild childhood you know cool nice experience it not bothers you it not holds you back in life it not mutilates you but a tattoo on an 18 year old on the hand who have no clue what he's doing in life this is mutilation because you know It is, in a lot of points, it is, there's probably a lot more from these kids regretting their visible tattoos than they got that journey that we do. Yeah, there's uh, more and more acceptance, but I don't know that that's a good thing. Like, No, here, it's not. In my eyes, it's here, absolutely not, you know. Like, for, for my part, I've had my face tattooed for 11 years, but I mean, I don't have a full face tattoo. But when I got my full, like, when I got my first face tattoos... Even then, there was a bit more, but it wasn't like crazy. I think 20 years ago, it was a real big deal if you had your face tattooed. Yeah, I have my face since 20 years. <laughs> When did you first get your face tattooed? Like the first thing you did? Yeah, I think when I was around 18, the end of 18 years, so something that would be like this. Something like 19 I already years? was very far. I started tattooing myself as 14. Yeah. Yeah, I, started, I think with, um, with 70, it start like start slowly getting out of hand. See, I started and I think with, with around middle of 18, I already got like majority of my body tattooed, like not as heavy as today, but like like a lot. Yeah, I started with piercings primarily. I had my first facial piercings when I was like 12, and I got into stretching piercings and stuff. And I wasn't even sure I was going to get a tattoo until. I think I got my first tattoo when I was 19. I started late for tattoos. I, it was my son's name on my arm. My son was uh, about to be born and, you know, it felt like a good place to start. And I already had around 100 piercings. I had some big stretch piercings already. And I kind of felt like, even then, I kind of felt like tattoos were sort of hipster territory. Like, I was more into heavy body mod ideas than tattoos because I seen a lot of people getting tattoos even then, and I thought... I don't really need one of those. It's not that cool. It's kind of, everybody has one anyway, you know? And so I, I had an odd approach here. I'm sitting, I've had somewhere over 1300 hours of tattooing now. And, and I'm telling you, even when I started, I didn't think I was ever going to get one. Like I, I was, I was of the mindset. I might never get one for a long time just because there was, it was already so kind of hipsterish. I thought the way people were doing it. So, Anyway, I got my first tattoo, and obviously I, I, I didn't really get my first bodysuit finished until I was 27, I think. But I just didn't have the money or the lifestyle uh, to do it. It wasn't until I was quite a bit older, and I think that was actually probably for the best, that, that I wasn't able to afford the work I wanted when I was that young. Because it probably would have been a lot worse. Because I, I feel like people know, know themselves better when they get older. You know? Yeah, I couldn't afford any of this, so that's why I tattooed myself. And I, I mean, I come out of the skateboard punk scene. Yeah. So I was like a skateboard the majority of my life, like pool skating and like hardcore. And, you know, and I don't mind it so much how the tattoos look at some point. I was like, yeah, I, I better have trashy tattoos than no tattoos. So I made them myself. Yeah. 
and I would sure it was go very soon that I was go very deep inside the material and I wanted then I start tattooing myself but it gets so fast so good that a lot of friends asked me also to get tattoo them and so it was just like you know I never planned to be a tattoo artist I never planned this it was just happened you know yeah from From my early age, I was fascinated from the tribes and stuff. I, in my first bodysuit, I had a lot of tribalistic stuff. I got hammered, I got stitched, I got like everything you can find in tribes. I got made on my body to got the experience, to got the look. And um, it was just like, it just never stopped, you know, like my, my quest for it never stopped. And so the tattooing started and like just so much people start asking me for tattoos. And I mean, in, in that time, there was like, I mean, there was not so many tattoo studios. It was not like these days. Oh, there's way more now. Yeah, for sure. And and the quality of tattoos, I mean, I would say these days, the, the quality, the standard of tattoo is so high, mm -hmm. like a good tattoo. It's, it's normal. It's not a good tattoo anymore. It, it's our standard, you know? Yeah, if it's not a 10 out of 10, it's a zero these days. Like, the, the quality has gone up a lot over the last 20 years. I remember, like, when I would see a really well done, like, portrait tattoo, you would think it was... I remember seeing, like, really high-level tattoos in the early 2000s, late 90s, and thinking, how the hell did they... And now it's like, if they're not that level, then... It's, it's like not even worth talking about. Like they have to be perfect. There's almost nothing yeah, it's, bad. It's being. standard. It's standard. Yeah, you know? exactly. But so it doesn't mean, you know, like back in the days, I would say it was very easy to make outstanding work. Mm -hmm. That's why I think for me it was so easy because I was just become a very good tattoo artist very fast. But back then there was not a lot of tattoo artists at all and very little good tattoo artists. So even when it comes to simple work, Mm -hmm. You know, you make some tribals or some scripts or stuff like this. this. Most of the tattooists couldn't do that proper. Then it looked nice healed, you know. And that's a so it was thing. very easy that like a lot of friends got tattooed. Their friends see the work and like, wow, that's like. And I was like having a little home studio, like a one room, you know, in my grandma's place and tattooed after work. And at some point I had so much people coming there that I like, wow. Like, you know, I guess I better do this happen. now. <laughs> See, I, I have such a huge problem with one of the things, one of the things you just said about it healed well. Like I have such a huge problem with these day one pictures that you see on social media of things looking in a way that you know they're not going to heal that way. Like I see a lot of uh, like white on black is a really trendy yeah. thing. And a lot of the way that they're doing it, you're like, that's just for the photo. They're not doing that in a way that it's going to be there or good, give a good product. It's just to make a nice picture. And then, then people don't explain what it takes to get the work to stay like that or support it. It's just, here's a really yeah, pretty picture. I think picture. That the tattoo artists are not honest about either, you know, to say someone like it's possible to make white on black, but oh, yeah. it takes you probably three rights. Huh? Yeah, it's to definitely have a nice possible. White on it. I've done a lot. Like I've... Uh, I've got, I just had a second pass on my face. We've got some white line work here, but we supported it with a different black and uh, it pops the white out. But like people don't want to do that much work. Like you're going to be in number of passes and you're going to have to use different types of ink and you're going you're gonna to have a lot of things not work perfect the first time. And people don't really like that. I get people asking me, if they can get their whole body blacked out or whatever in a session. Like people want it fast, easy. They don't want to fuck with uh, having to do second passes and um, they don't want to, they don't want to have any of the hard stuff. They just want the product right away. And yeah, I think that that's the problem with the, with the black work stuff who is no so trendy. Everybody won't get black work and put white on it and stuff yeah. or things like this. And I, I, I have to say, I seen that black work trend started like so long ago. Mm -hmm. And when I, I remember it's really, really long ago, I had some friends and myself, we got black sleeves, but I mean, we got black sleeves because we had a lot of stuff and like on myself, there was no much other ways. And even my sleeves, there's still some stuff who wasn't black. It was not just a blackout. 
it was just blackout to the degree that it was needed because there were so many old bad tattoos under. And all the people I know back in that time, back in the in the early BME days, we was having that amount of black because there was so much stuff under. Yeah. Not because we want to look tough, you know. And then you see the it started like 18, 19 year old, they just make a black sleeve with yeah, nothing yeah. under. And I never got this because I think First, for me as a tattoo artist, like making just black, it was it, it's the most boring thing. Yeah, yeah. I, my art, the artist who uh, actually he's doing all my white on black and black on black layers. But he did my leg blackouts for me, and he told me like it was one of the most boring things he's ever done. It was methodical. Like you have to be in the same layer of skin and really know your depths and and do a good like you still have to do good work, but it's boring as fuck. He didn't have fun doing it. And also, yeah. I feel like if you get a blackout as your first tattoo, you're you're uh, denying a lot of fun along the way. Like I had full coverage everywhere before I did any blackout, and I feel like that's the way that you should do blackout. You should have a whole story first, and then blackout is kind of like uh, the second, like it's a new beginning or like a, a rebirth or a second chance or whatever the hell you want to call it. It should be the second layer, though. It shouldn't be. You shouldn't do a blackout from start, I don't think. Yeah, yeah, I guess they, they you know, it's they they try to skip the journey. They see people like us and think I want to be looked at tough, you know, and, and do not understand. It's not about we not make this to look tough. We just <laughs> make this because at some point there's no other way around. Yeah, you want to get no more tattoos and you have going. everything covered. That's what happened. It's a, it's just happened, you know. It's not that like, well, what is the most radical tattoo? It wasn't. No. For me, it never was this. And even in my tattoo work, I done a lot of there a lot of back, a, a lot of pieces which have bigger parts of black. But even you look all my my tattoo work, there's never like more than thirty percent of black somewhere. It's all layers and layers. I mean, it's mostly very heavy covered tattoos. Yeah. But I like to play with it as an artist and as a craftsman. I think. It's nice, you know, and sure, when you work on that scale on people's, like I made a lot of bodysuits, a lot of really big pieces. At some point, I, I, you know, I, I was say the only way you get a tattoo from me is you start with minimum a back piece. And that was like 15 years ago where people didn't make big pieces. I was say like, that's the only way to get a session with me is to make a big piece because I'm interested in make big pieces. And I'm interested in people who want to go for a longer journey. And that's the people's. You not can make big pieces without that you have to cover stuff. So in, I would say, 98% of all my tattoos as a tattoo artist, there is cover stuff. Yeah. Because that's barely at the end in the last years that I had people's. They come for a bodysuit. They come for big pieces with nothing under. But... Yeah, from like 100 bodysuits I'd done, there was one person who had not one single tattoo. He come and made a bodysuit. Mm -hmm. He wait very long. He say he want a tattoo sign since 18, but he waited till 25. He collect money. He wanted to get a piece by me and he wanted a bodysuit. We tattooed his suit in 11 months because he wanted to make it as a ritual in one year. It, it But people see why well, he make it in 11 months. No, this guy waited six or seven years. Yeah. Collect money, collect motivation, prepare, don't get a tattoo, you know, to make this really something special for him and to keep it free, to keep it clean, to to not ruin it. Yeah. And this is a lot of dedication in a different level that you not find so often. And even for someone like me who was special specialized on bodysuits, on heavy work, this happened one time, you know. But as I say, 98%... I had to cover something. So I was in need of some bigger pieces of black always to cover stuff. I think uh, when you have a person do that, when they save money for seven years and they travel to a specific artist and they have a goal like that, you could say they were getting tattooed for seven years. You know what I mean? Like it's. Yeah, I know. It's, the ritual start not when you make it, it start it, when you think about it. Yeah. You're preparing, you know? There was a lot of that for me. What, like I said, it took me quite a while to finish my first bodysuit. I didn't have the, I wasn't in the right position in my life to do everything I wanted to when I wanted to. So the minute I was, 
I started working really quick. It was like, okay, now I'm ready. I, I know what I want. And it got there really fast. But the, what happened was, I think it, in doing that and going so often, I was getting tattooed two to five times a week generally um, when, I, when I started ramping up. I really fell in love with the whole process of it and just kept wanting to do that. And I had nothing left to work with. You know, I was like, well, I guess I'm blacking out my right arm and like, cause I don't want to stop. Like, you know, I, I think it's becomes a bit of an addiction and uh, it's, it's tough for me to draw a line on uh, what that takes over. Like people who've been following me for a, a while have commented, you know, my face, it keeps getting closer and close. Like I keep extending it higher and higher and framing my face more and more. And um, it's, it's a really hard line for me to navigate because it is something I enjoy so much. Um, I mean, this is what you say is, uh, for me, it's very crazy because I experienced this not on me. I experienced that with like a lot of people. I go with through this journey. A lot of my clients, they come, they have some stuff or they have good. I, you know, here in silent, we covered like crazy work. Like people spend a lot of money, travel to someone, get a sleeve, like really good. Yeah. And I tell them like, you know. I have to tell you, it will suck, but you will cover this arm just black. <laughs> you will cover like a 6,000 euro piece from a really world-class name tattoo artist and you will hate it, but you will be there. And they all stand there and say, no, they will never, they keep this. And at some point they have a bodysuit with one sleeve who absolutely have nothing to do with the rest of their body. Yeah. And then they sit there and get tattooed like from my, from my friends here, you know, and I walk in the shop. And they lie there, get their arm black, and I just come, I told you so. I told you. <laughs> uh, Because, you know, I, I, I also, my, my Tetras, we, we plan this stuff ahead, you know? Because when you go into the journey for a bodysuit, you plan maybe to keep your sleeve. But we know you will not, probably. To 95% you will not, because me, my, my tattoo artist here, we, we go through this journey my, ourselves. We go with, to this journey with a lot of our clients here over many years. We've seen this happen over and over again. So for us as a good tattoo artist who works on bodysuits, you want to give your client the best piece possible. So that means you, you plan in not maybe that they keep their sleeve. You plan in what do I do when they at the yeah. end want to cover their sleeve? How can I connect? So you kind of have to think a couple of steps ahead. Yeah, you Because have to read between the lines. This is what's naturally happening. And this, I think, makes you a good tattoo artist for bodysuit work to think ahead of your clientele. Because you, you are to understand, they, they go on a, a ride who takes like them between three and 10 years. But you want to be, give the best bodysuit you can do on them when the time comes. You not do. I do know the best front piece possible. You say, okay, maybe I have to make a little compromise here on the shoulder, but that compromise allows me in five years, whenever the time comes to connect the sleeve in a way better way. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's the thinking ahead. It makes the difference, you know, and just because someone says he never would do that doesn't mean he will not because when he say this, he's right. I was a lot of things doing on my body. I will say, I will never do. Yeah, you because don't, you, it you was not, not the time there, there you know? There. Yeah, it takes a minute to get there. People don't see where they're going to be five years from now, right? Where they're going to be 10 years from now when they're done and they're going to still want to go. That's where, as a tattoo artist that's seen this happen over and over again, you, you got to plan for when that logic falls apart, when they're, they're going back on it. All of a sudden they do want the, the blackout or they do want the, the new thing, right? You have to know that that's going to happen. Like you'll, you'll see that even in small, like where I work here, someone will come in for, they'll go, oh, I want a half sleeve. And I tell every artist here, make sure you have a plan for when they want the rest of that sleeve because they don't know what they're saying right now. Like they think they want a half sleeve, but that's going to become more than that. So it's on you to leave that open. Yeah, it's touching the waters, you know, but it's okay. It's a good thing, you know. Yeah. But it's like you as a, as a good artist, you have to adopt to this, you know? Mm -hmm. And when it comes to bodysuits, even more. But I think 
When you really like the idea of big pieces, you should go directly to an artist who really have experience with bodysuits. And I get there are not many out there anymore who really experience with bodysuits because in my, it's so different to tattoo an entire body than to give a bodysuit. It's like with a sleeve. A lot of people have entire tattooed arms, but less people have real sleeves, like planned, thoughtful sleeves. Yeah. Yeah, it's like patchwork and they, they figure out how to put it together later where it's not just one big organic part of a bigger work. Like what I'm, I'm trying to do with my third layer is create a bodysuit that's cohesive all the way through because my first one was very much stitched together. It was like I got tattoos at a pace I could afford at a time I could get them and, and then I figured out how to put them all together later. That's what my first suit was. So then the blackout, obviously, that's more connected than the first layer was. But now I want something even more connected than that. I want something even larger. My whole body is the tattoo. Like that's the concept that I'm trying to work with now. And that's that's big vision because you're in that for years. Like you want to make that work. It's going to take a minute. At least it's been my experience. <clears throat> I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, you. You're, you have a daughter who was two when she started tattooing. Am I right on that? Yes. How did that? She's not twelve. How did that begin? <laughs> yeah, I, I. You know, she was like. I think she started talking, and then she. I mean, she grew up with like probably very heavy tattooed parents and mm -hmm. the friends around and grow up kind of in that, you know, like, yeah, tattooing is my life, you know, it's no, no, what it is, you know, I make my living with it. I always, we had a good life because I, I'm a tattooist, you know, of course. and she spent also some time in, in the shop a lot because I'm, I'm a crazy workaholic. I'm an artist. I'm, I drive for this. Like I, I sleep very little. I spend all my day for it. You know, at home, I paint, I do everything is in my thing. Mm -hmm. So she grew up with this. And as soon as she could talk, she was say, Oh, she wanted a tattoo, you know, because she liked to paint because I think it's an interactional thing. You know, I, I love to paint. So it's sure I sit at home and paint. She sit there and paint with me, you know, and it become, yeah, you paint with your daughter. We all, a lot of parents do, you know, but when a lot of parents do it a little, so the children paint a little, but when you just draw a lot, your children will sit a lot to you and paint with you. Yeah. So she will, she was probably paint a lot more than other children and just scribbling around, but with any kind of, I sit there and paint a canvas. So she painted canvases since she's one and a half years old. She was, I have canvases hanging in my, in my house who are from my daughter when she was like, could barely hold a paintbrush. And it's, it's funny, you know, it's not that I, I love how it looks, you know, but like, it's what she could do in that time, you know? Yeah. And then she was like, for me, tattooing always was a medium because I was an artist before I was like tattooing, you know, I was like very big into graffiti, into scribbling. That's why my style is progressed in that way. Yeah. It's very connected to my roots of graffiti, but graffiti, like real graffiti vandalism, not like making arty stuff, you know. I love the scribble stuff. I love just playing with script, calligraphy, this kind of thing, abstract, because graffiti is a lot of about abstracting letters. So that's where the roots of my tattooing come. And as soon as she was like, like, oh, I want to also try to tattoo. And at some point I was like, yeah, why not, you know. And then with two, she was like tattooing the first time um, with uh, Gerhard Wiesbeck was has assist her, hold her like the cable and the machine and she could barely hold the machine. And sure, it was just scribbling. And then my friend see it and everybody was like, wow, I want also a tattoo from Maya. Yeah. <laughs> and then like she made a lot of tattoos to friends and it sure, at this time we just paint her square yeah. on the body and say, look, that is your paper, you know, just... <laughs> to use some color like she painted on a paper, you know? And it was very funny to see her progression because the older she got, you could see she was like, that she was painting like real motifs. And then she was like, boy, 
I want to tattoo this, you know, like Billy kid stuff, you know, but like there was always someone who say like, yeah, why not? I want this. Mm -hmm. And so it was a, you know, then she was like into the, the, the frozen stuff, the ice queen and things. So she painted and then she was like, would be cool to tattoo this. And then I asked her a few friends and then the friend was like, yeah, wow, I really want this. <laughs> and then it was very funny to see how, how her tattooing progressed with her painting, with her, her skills, you know, she could start painting straighter lines. She could start tattooing straighter lines mm -hmm. and no, it's very ridiculous. She's 11, but she's like completely tattooing herself. She has like some people's coming really for a tattoo for her and she like make the motif herself. She make everything by herself. And from over the years, we was had to assist her less and less and less. And no, you just like, really, she like, I go, she sit there alone in the shop. We have the, I think it was one of the, one of the most amazing moments for me. She was, um, there was a guy here. He wanted long a tattoo and he, he to meet Maya before he am silent. He talked with her about the tattoo. And at some point he was here for a few days and he asked, yeah, can you tattoo me tomorrow? And Maya is like, you know, she's not a professional tattoo artist. It's like, there are some people, they want a tattoo from her, but like, you know, you have to be in the right time in the right place with her. Mm -hmm. When, when, when you're there and she really won't make you a tattoo, she make you a tattoo. You cannot really plan it with her. Oh, of course. So not. You, it's not like you're booking you have to plan that she's here <laughs> and that she, in that time, when there's like friends here and she don't want a tattoo, she will not tattoo you. Yeah. No, she start being a little bit more serious about, you know, like become a tattoo artist thing. But be, be, before it was very funny. A lot of friends wanted a tattoo, but always was there when she didn't like to tattoo right now. Mm -hmm. And um, that one time it was so funny because she promised the guy for like a long time to make him a tattoo. But every time she was like, oh, I didn't have time, didn't was motivated. <laughs> but then she, she say, okay, tomorrow I promise I make you the tattoo, you know, and she's a very good person. So she was really like, yeah, I have to make him the tattoo tomorrow. And then it was her friend there. It was Basti's kids there. It was the neighbor kids here, you know, it was the full, like, I don't know, eight children mayhem in the garden playing around. But then the Maya, like the oldest, she have to make a tattoo, like very serious, you know? Yeah. And she was like, okay, I have to stop playing now. I have to tattoo. So she was going to shop and prepare everything, but there was no other tattoo artist there. So at some point I walk in the shop and there's this guy and he's a really big, tough guy. And he got tattooed from Maya and he sit on the bench and there sit Maya tattooing and like seven kids around her. And it was like in a, in a different universe, you know, where like this big adult sit there, get tattooed and only kids there. <laughs> and it was such a funny moment, you know, like she just doing her thing there. And the other kids, they all know Maya tattoos and they like, oh, it's interesting. But they also was just playing in the shop because What's the, the uh, shop kind of was closed. What was and the tattoo? What? Do you remember what the tattoo was? Yes, was a very... <laughs> I, I can send you the tattoo. You remind me, then you can show it. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to see it. I'd love to see the dude too, the big tough guy. Yeah, I think I have. I can even send you a small. Um, I made a video recording. Oh yeah. Because it was so funny for me. It was so ridiculous. I I loved it. You know. Yeah. You walked there in the shop, and I seen everything in there. You know, a lot of crazy stuff happened in Thailand. But this is like, you know, was such a beautiful moment to see like. Okay. Yeah. Like this was so, so different, but so poor and raw. Mm -hmm. I really liked it. Yeah. But she's <laughs> just like doing her thing now. And it's very funny because it's so natural for her because she make it so long mm -hmm. and she made so many work and her work really becomes very good because she has so much control with the machine because it's for her like painting. Yeah. Uh, so I was looking at like, obviously you can't see everything she's done on Google. I did my best to find some pictures, but there's not much out there, right? There's only whatever you've put up or whatever has been shared. But like from what I've seen, it was healing like better than most actual tattoo artists work. And it was funny yeah. to see the contrast. It's a uh, kid's drawings, but they're saturated like crazy. Like they're, they're super in there, you know? Like yeah, that, that's what I mean. It's so surrealistic also for us as artists. And we have a lot of other tattoo artists coming here. 
Yeah. We have a lot of tattoo artists got work from her and it's so ridiculous what she does, you know. Also, her healing, it's like, it's so painful to get for, tattooed from her. <sighs> it's like very hardcore. The healing is very hardcore. Yeah. But it, it, it's so sad. It heals good, you know. It, it takes long for heal. Mm -hmm. But it looks, it's so saturated. She makes big ass line work mm. and the lines are bang, you know. Yeah, there's like you, you <laughs> sit there as a tattoo artist, think this, like, how do you make lines like this? This took me like a decade to make lines like this. Yeah. But then you realize she's tattooing a decade now. Mm. And you know, a lot about tattooing is about understand the body, have the feeling for it. Mm. And this is the craftsmanship. And when you do something long, you have all the muscle memory in between. You have, you know, so much other things go into the intuition of a craftsmanship. Not just learning the skills is one thing, but to have a real feeling for something. And especially so, everyone's body is a little bit different too. Every single person's skin can vary, right? Like you got to know how to adapt almost to the person you're working on. There is a method yeah. to tattooing for sure, but some people will come in here with, with uh, worse skin than others. And then you have to know how to navigate or say tattooing an armpit might be different than tattooing the outside of a bicep, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of learning each area even. Yeah, I think that's the thing. And I think in, for her, it's like a lot of the stuff, it's hard for her to explain why, but it's, she have the experience mm -hmm. because she just gr grow up like this. She grow up tattooing people and she like, uh, it, she liked the experience to give it. And it was very funny. I got from her a tattoo like a month ago mm -hmm. because like she tattooed a friend and then we made a little joke because now she's like start becoming a teenager, you know? So we start talking a little bit about, and then um, at the end he was like, yeah, I want this tattooed note. And then I was like, yeah, I need this also. <laughs> and it was a very funny moment. Also, it's like here, my, one of my best friends and we just get a, a STD test made. We made every couple of months, we make STD tests and we just got a fresh STD test, you know, like just two days before and he got tattooed. And then I was like, fuck it, take the machine and give me a tattoo, you know, <laughs> that was my, my, one of my best tat friends. And then like, you know, we got just tested fresh. So it's like no harm. Yeah. And it's kind of funny also with the STD testing when I made all my big pieces. We try like with couples with the double backs. I like always speak with them and I tattoo them with the same needle also for the experience wise. And when we made the big pieces, it was very difficult to take care of cross contamination on of everything. Mm -hmm. But no, from being a little bit deeper in the porn world. Also, I learn, you know, also we, we made a lot of crazy, crazy stuff with friends and orgies and swinging yeah. stuff, you know, and we always took very good care of this safer sex and protection. But no, we had a point also when we have friends over, you know, everybody get tested and you come and you have a lot of fun. You don't have to give a damn shit, but you, it's not like this because you give a lot more care because when everybody tests and takes care, it's so much more safer than the safest you can be. Mm -hmm. It's one step ahead. And when I would go back in time and I would make all the big pieces of tattooing, I would require that people get tested before to protect them and everyone else around, you know? Yeah, yeah you can't be too careful for sure. Um, I did want to say one more thing about um, uh, your daughter and tattooing. It, it struck me that learning an instrument when you're young, like it seems like we can learn things easier the younger we are. So say she continues tattooing, do you think that she has almost a otherworldly capability because she started so young to become one of the best to ever do it? Like yeah, being that's so the young crazy start. thing, which I have no idea. You know, I know, like I, I know, Philip Bleu started with fifteen. Mm -hmm. Like you know, so and what he becomes, we all know because you have a different intuition with the machine. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what Maya will become. She is all over the place, but like, yeah, she's 12. Yeah. So my, she speaks my a lot about her future and stuff. And no, she speaks a lot that she want to become an artist because she don't like the idea to work for someone else and so on. But also she's 12. Yeah. 
And I don't like the idea to pressure her. Oh yeah, I, no, I would never, I would never think, oh, well, she has to do it. It's more from you, you, theoretical of if you start tattooing when you're two and you keep tattooing, like how good will you be with tattooing? You know, it's, it's like Mozart learning how to play piano when he was very young and then violin when he's very young. And, you know, like all these instruments, you learn so much easier when you're young. Um, I feel like let, let's say I would be very curious how far she would push it. Yeah. But I would not, you know, whatever happens, it's not in my hands. Of course. Yeah. You would, and you would just want to show I, her. I, I would love to see how far she push it, you know, but also I, I would way more than this. I would say to see, I want to see how far she push life, whatever life is for her. You and I will support her with that. I don't care if she get a tattooist or whatever she want to do, you know. It, that's what life should be about, pushing stuff you love. Mm -hmm. That's why I push tattooing that far, because I really love it. And that's why I'm not into filmmaking, because I yeah. was into filmmaking and pictures and cameras before I even started tattooing. I started series photography with 14. So like this is a passion, it's even longer than tattooing what I'm into now. Yeah, I was going to ask you, you, do you tattoo very often anymore at all? Cause no, I don't. I, 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 I thought you didn't, but I heard some people tell me that you were still tattooing, and so I wanted to just ask you. Yeah, um, I was tattooing for, we made this funny, like a really good friend of mine, he's also really into like kind of crazy pushing sports. Yeah. And I pushed him to go back into running, and then we make this, we run a half marathon was the first time we run that long. And we run through the trails here around in the forest. And, um, every few kilometers, my friends waiting with the, with like a rotary tattoo gun and, um, made some weird challenges for us, like tattooing blind, tattooing with the left hand. <laughs> it was more a funny, silly thing, but I didn't make a, 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 a tattoo. What tattooing is for me, like going into a session, you know, for me, I don't like to call stuff spiritual and I, I don't, I just hate it. But for me, tattooing was very ritualistic. Mm -hmm. It was, I had my little ceremony I made in the morning, which not, no one was knowing because it was way too hippie and spiritual to share that with people, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, for your image, you want to be the tough tattoo artist. You cannot make the hippie stuff. I think you can, but I, I understand what you mean. Like, no, I, 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 I love to joke about, you know, because. I hate the idea of what people make out of a spiritual thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's they, a bad they, look. they search the spiritual thing. And I say, you cannot, you, you don't search it. You become it with your experience, but you cannot push it. You know, mm -hmm. you have, you to just have to be it. open minded. But for me to uh, a session was not only about make the tattoo. I like the idea to push people over their, their boundaries, you know, and I not made this to be tough. I made this to give the people the experience. It's like the same. You do a body suspension or you do any kind of ritual. The experience will push you further is part of it. So the people who have had a tattoo from me, they probably, when you meet someone in real life, they tell you this was the toughest thing I done in my life, you know, because it was my intention to push them yeah. because that gives them strength. But, at, but I also was very picky with the people I choose for tattooing. I not, when someone come and say, I like your, I like how it looks. I want a tattoo from you. They didn't get a session with me. Yeah. It's about I more than tattoo that. the people's who write me a long message that they're in this point of life and they need something who, you know, to kick them in the face that they can stand up again and go in the next chapter of life. That's the people I tattooed. And I know I give them this and the tattoo is not about how it looks. The, the look goes together with the experience and it gives them strength in life. Because they look at it and see, I survived him. I survived everything. Yeah. And yeah. Tattoo has this, always been cathartic. My intention was not to bring the people to their, to their limits. It was to push them over their limits mm -hmm. to show them what they're able to, because I'm very known for going to places where you're not supposed to go because I love it. I love the aspect of rituals where I push myself in a place where I think I'm not able to go. Yeah. I just love it. So, I, I have, I, you know, there's no bullshitting around. I'm not extreme because I want to be tough. I just love the moments in my mind to cross a boundary with myself. I love 
to push my mind. And I love to give this experience to people. But that's where we are. It's hard because you're still on people and you still don't want to mutilate people and I want to give them still a good experience. And that means everyone is different. Every session, I don't know what I get into, you know, but it still was very, it was not just sitting down and tattoo the people. It was like a different moment for me because you're guiding someone through a very heavy experience in his life. It needs a very strong mind from yourself because just because you sit there and you say, I want to stop. I sure you want to stop. Every time I got tattooed, I want to stop. Mm. It's a strong, every time I make something crazy and hooks or any crazy ritual, I don't want to do it. Everyone would do crazy stuff. Even if it's whatever you talk, you go into extreme sport, you go into whatever the people who do the crazy shit. There's a lot of pain, suffering, and the mind tells you constantly to don't do it. Stop. Mm -hmm. But that's the point to push over that burden, to bring yourself in a place where, whoa, I never was thinking I can do this. That is where you benefit. And for me to go into sessions like this was a different mindset. And it's a, a lot of burden also you put on you, you know, because you never know when, like, the, I, I usually work in weeks. I make a tattoo week and I had a lot of people there. They stay here. And I bring myself into the mindset of the tattooist, the, the one guiding them through the week, yeah. not only through a session, through a full week of this. And I have multiple persons there who interact with each other in the time they're here. So like they affect each other. So it's different, you know, and I can say I 100% let go from this. I will never, ever be a tattoo artist anymore. I will never, ever go in there because I'm so far from being a tattoo artist, from being that person, being little swastika, the one who made this with the people. Yeah. I'm far away from this. And just me taking a, a like a non-professional machine in the hand, like a hundred euro China rotary machine and scribble on a friend while we're running a marathon. It's not tattooing, you know, I that's know like you everyone you can do this. It's uh, for you. It's it's uh, almost like a modern. I, I described you as this on my reacts, and maybe it was um, I didn't flush it out much what I meant. But I said your process at Sciland is as close to a modern day shaman as you can get, and I didn't mean that in a derogatory way. From what I've read into you and what I've seen on your your YouTube videos, it is a very spiritual experience. And I feel like I, I understand where that comes from, but where I live and the people I interact with, we don't have the vocabulary to describe that. It's like a, it's really hard to explain that to people that just get a one-off tattoo here or there. But like I, people think I'm addicted to pain or that I'm addicted to getting like a new tattoo for the look or whatever. But what I'm actually in, really addicted to, I think, is overcoming and surviving and seeing that there's life after the, the, the worst, the darkness. Cause like tattooing is just symbolic of that for me. Like you survive a bad relationship, you survive a parent dying, you survive uh, your dog dying, your wife leaving you, you know? And then tattooing is, is sort of like a physical manifestation yeah, it's a, surviving. It's, you know, it's the marking. You, you know, you go back to what you were saying. I was like the longest time in the end of Little Swastika on my, in, in social media, on the world. I not try to label myself, but I put this modern shamanic philosopher of life. This is how I labeled myself because I, I, I'm not a shaman. I'm not a teacher, anything, but I know I use a lot of shamanic techniques yeah. into my work because I mean, what is shamanic techniques is guiding you. The thing is, I'm not the one doing this. When you come and you make this experience with me, you are the one doing it. Mm -hmm. I'm just the tool you choose. You're facilitating it. You're when, the when you want, you know, you want to back in the times, a lot of people come, they're like, you know, you, I know you are the toughest tattooist, the hardest to survive. That's why I'm here, you know, because that's the tool they choose for their spiritual journey. They and I, under I understand this and I accept I'm not their shaman. I'm the tool they choose. And I 
they, they choose the tool with the most knowledge they probably found in that specific thing they want to do. It's the same. You want to take ayahuasca. You better go to a shaman who have a lot of experience with taking ayahuasca himself yeah. because he can help you. He cannot guide you, but he can help you be a guidance in your own guiding. Mm -hmm. And that, this that is a is difference very important. because to understand whatever happens in a session, I, I know what to do, but I can, I can advise you. I can push you a little bit. I can try to guide you, but you are the one guiding your mind through this. Yeah. Yeah. It's and, uh, set and setting. Like it's good to have someone there who knows what to do, but it's all about who you are and what you're going through too. Right? If you're not in the right headspace, it doesn't matter who you're working with. Yeah, that's the thing. And sure, me, with my experience and with you come to me and you know what my experience is, mm -hmm. it's easier for you to trust my words because, you know, he knows. He was there many times before. Yeah. When he says, this is the way to go through, that's probably my best call. And do you think that's part of why it's hard for you to respect the tattooer with no tattoos? Because you brought that up earlier. Uh, yeah, I mean, what experience. you you get tattooed by someone who don't have a sleeve? Oh, he want to tell you about the healing. Oh, he want to tell you about all the stuff. Yeah. He, he can't. Point, you know? Yeah, I agree with that completely. When you see a tattooer with no tattoos, it is a warning sign for me. It's like, do you not live this life? Are you not part of this culture? Some people think that's elitism, but some elitism is okay. Like I want, Yo, I mean, it is what it is, you know, like yeah. for me, this is way more than just like a job and either it's for you more than a job or you should not fucking make it. Yeah, I agree. It should be a lifestyle. You, you are always the tattooer. If you're doing the tattoo, you have an attachment to the client and to the piece and to all of it. Um, I wanted to ask you one more thing I definitely wanted to get into is what, what do you deal with? How do you deal with pain? What do you think of pain as? Because I have a lot of interesting thoughts on pain, like physical pain. What is your interpretation of that? I can first say I'm like, I'm not into pain. I'm not a masochist and not a sadist or anything. I don't like to give pain. I don't like to receive pain. Mm -hmm. I understand and accept that pain is a tool. Yeah. A tool in a lot of rituals necessary, you know, not, I, I never in my life ever tried intentionally give someone more pain than necessary. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely definitely over everything. You know, like I hate this idea of tattoo artists who try to make it more painful. Mm -hmm. I don't, it don't need to, I can just tattoo you a little bit more. I can just extend the session so that this pain is, um, clarified as something, you know, it, it necessary when I make you after you make a back piece like in three days and I not bring you to that point of that you over the border I just extend the back piece mm -hmm. till and I, I don't care if I make you another half sleeve you know I make a like my pricing was very simple I, I, I made pricing per sessions usually my first piece you, you pay for the one piece And my intention was to kind of bring you to the point of breakage. You get at minimum a back piece, but depends on your strengths. Mm -hmm. You got like an, a half sleeve on top of it, you know, or like your ass on top of it. That was, I, I felt it's like hard to put in words. It, I felt how much more pain is necessary, but I not just try to make pain. Yeah. I, you know, I, It, it was a need for the pain, you know, but I understand that pain is a necessary tool in some sorts for myself. Sure. The way how I live and how I look and what I done, you all know there was a lot of pain involved. Yeah, of course there has It's, to be. <laughs> it is what it is. You know, I, I, my, my entire first bodysuit, I never took one painkiller or anything for this. You know, I don't like the idea also no with the creams. Like I, 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 sure I used some creams on like a couple of spots, but like you I've know, never my balls. actually tried numbing cream myself. I I have What? no problem with like I'm not judging people who do it necessarily, but I've just I've gotten through everything so many times that it's just never really been a thought. Now there are some areas that were bad enough that 
I've thought about using it if I ever go there again. I really yeah, but that's that's try. what I mean. I'm like I go through most <laughs> of the experience without, especially on my first. Yeah. Then sure, I use I use some numbing cream for my balls as example. You know. Uh, I've thought and about if I ever go. There near are some my... parts where I would absolutely agree. It makes sense to use numbing cream also for the tattoo artist. You know, but these days people start like using numbing cream all over the place. Yeah. I hate the idea when people come to me and they put numbing cream on their ribs. I tattooed the other side of the body because also the healing is horrible on numbing cream. Mm -hmm. The tattooing is horrible of numbing cream. So also to understand when we in a session and I bring you in the mindset of the session, I can get you through the session. But when I tattoo you where the numbing cream is and I touch a place where it's not numb, oh. I can't tattoo you there because then your body, you never get into this. Yeah. Yeah. And The, the scale of how I worked it. was too big and too chaotic that I could plan where I work. You'd almost have to have the whole body numbed in order to do that. Because you're going to... No, like at least a full back, but then some lines crossing yeah. the back. It depends on how the session goes. And I like to keep the sessions fluid so I can adopt to the people. So I can adopt to me. I can adopt to the session and I can form the session around the tattoo and not other way around. And... For this, it just never worked. And usually when someone come the first time, I put numbing cream, I tattoo the other side, he never come with numbing cream again. Because <laughs> <laughs> also, you, you want to tattoo a full body with numbing cream that costs you like a lot of money. Yeah. Also, it's the numbing cream affects the body in a very bad way. It's like, then when you ask me, better take some painkiller than take numbing cream, you know? It's the same harm for the body, you know? But at least it calms down your mind a little bit. Yeah. Instead of, you know, you, in my eyes, take four ibuprofen. It sucks also, but putting a lot of numbing cream on your body, I've seen heavy effects on people because of all the lidocaine goes in the body. That together with a strong tattoo session, it's really fucks the people up. They're full on drugged. So then they also can take some painkiller. But for me as a tattoo artist, it was the better way. Hmm. And there is no painkiller would take you that pain away anyway. No, absolutely not. Uh, there, as I was saying, there are a few places that uh, I did black out. If I ever needed to touch them up, I would consider, um, I would consider numbing my inner ass cheeks or my deep inner thighs. I didn't enjoy those sessions. And uh, when I say that, I don't say it lightly. I enjoy most tattoos. I've, I've had each of my armpits tattooed 11 times. Like we have layers on layers and layers. Nothing like, if, if I'm saying I find it unpleasant, it means it was pr pretty bad. So, like I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm the toughest guy ever, but I wouldn't deny maybe using numbing cream on a few places if I went there again. Like, yeah, I mean, it's like it's, it's the mindset you have to get into. You know, I'm yeah. like very known for like being a very pussy. No one want to tattoo me. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I'm also, when I was younger, I was stronger, you know, and I'm still, it, it's hard for the people to tattoo me because, like, I cry and scream and stuff, but I just not stand up, you know, and this is something I tell, told all my clients, if we have him silent, no one gives a shit if you cry here. We want people accept to let go, you know, Yeah. and we said, no, don't worry, we have like a, like a sound system, we have probably the biggest sound system a tattoo studio can have. It's a festival sound studio almost, you know. When there are some people that scream so loud, you just make the music so loud. They Sometimes in a session, this, it's required. It's hard to say before, you know. But yeah. some people, I see, they have very hard to let go. To make the music, like, very loud so they feel protected from this. It helps, you know, because Drowns it, it helps yeah. to... Then you, you know, don't fight yourself, I always say. You're in a session and you want to cry then fucking cry whatever it takes for you to let go, but don't fight yourself or don't fight me, you know, just let it happen. But when you're then in a place where you're like, you want to be pretend in front of me, you're tougher. You can't, I feel your body. I made this many years with many peoples. I know when you suffer in front of me, mm. if you cry out loud or not, I feel it and I know it. So it makes for me no difference. Uh, one one thing I wanted to bring up here somewhere, I wasn't sure where I was going to fit this, but um, your departure from social media 
I was aware of, I was around then when you left Instagram. Um, I seen that. And here I am about four or five years later, whatever it is. I kind of want to do it myself. I'm more and more sick of it all the time. I enjoy making YouTube content. That's about the only thing I enjoy. I enjoy doing stuff like this. I enjoy doing uh, my tattoo vlogs, talking about what I'm up to, um, talking about tattoos on YouTube. I enjoy all of that. But I really, really just, I'm very burnt out on social media. Uh, I wanted to ask you, as someone who is very well known, I, I'm pretty well known on social media. What was it like for you to get away from it? And how did it enrich your life? Because I'm sure it did. The, the, the thing is, you know, it's very hard with me because, like, I'm not little swastika anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. I buried this person. You became this a This was a person. chapter of my life I closed. It was an experience and it was a different person, you know? It was a different mindset. And for me, as little swastika, I think it was, I never was much into media, you know? When you, when you Google for little swastika, you find probably four pictures. The same four pictures because there exists not much pictures from Little Swastika. Yeah. Point. There, when you, you find a lot of tattoo work, but you find, like, you know, I work on a very big, on like a book. It's my art book about the chapter of Little Swastika. There will be, there's like a ton of pictures inside from tattoos, from stuff no one's seen. Not even my friends and my apprentices will see that work, you know, mm -hmm. because I, I never published that much and I was never that big on social media. I think I tried always to be, I just was there enough that I could do the work I done because I was knowing it's necessary to show enough of my work to find the next row of clients who want to go the ride with me for pushing the next step, what I want to do. Yeah. And at the, at the very end, I mean, I was so known and I had so much requests and I enjoyed so much more the really ritualistic part of tattooing that I was just shutting down my social media entirely. And I think the last three years of me tattooing, I published not one single picture. Yeah. I have on my, on my social media, I put this, this fuck the social media thing. Remember. <laughs> and I didn't publish anything for the last three years of my tattooing. But in that time, I didn't know I will, st I, I, I was knowing that Tattooing will be not my end thing. I know I was, I want to have another chapter in life mm -hmm. because I, I pushed tattooing very far. And at some point for me as an artist, I was like, how far can I push a certain thing? But then we are, I worked with the medium humans. There's a mind behind, there's a body behind, there's mutilation. You can harm someone, you know? And I would say I pushed it very far, what you can push a human body. And I, I, I still, I didn't want to harm people, you know, and I was scared when I would like continue as a, as an artist using that medium skin because I never see myself much as a tattoo artist. That's why in very early in my career, I was let go from trying to be a tattoo artist. I didn't go to tattoo conventions. I don't guest spot. I closed my tattoo studio. I start working in a private gallery. No one was know me, you know, or know me, know where I am. It was very tricky to find out where is this guy? Who I, can I contact this guy? And even when I had social media, you couldn't contact me over social media. Mm. You could not write a message over Facebook or Instagram. I shut all of this down. It was just no way. So it was a little more tricky to find me. So I was never that super easy reachable person, but still accept this is a tool to use to a degree that it's okay for me. But at the end of this, I've, there was no need for me anymore, you know, because I accept I don't want to push it further. I don't want to make a bigger piece, you know. I don't want to make faster pieces. I pushed it. And, you know, you push a, making a back piece in 74 minutes, having a friend shivering three days in fever next to you, like taking care of him, like in a hospital, and understand... This was scary, you know, and this was like hardcore to heal this. Yeah, we I don't want to push this anymore. And I think if it's 74 minutes or 64 minutes, it doesn't matter. We, I proved to myself I can push this very 
more further than I ever imagined I can push it. And here I have to make the line also to understand I was in a place in that time I already influenced so many tattooists out there, so many people. Your style is very And a lot perfect. of the stuff in a way I didn't like because they don't accept that there's a person behind, there's healing behind, that it can get dangerous. And this is, I, I, I don't mind that there's like so many people like, you no, know, like copy it. Like what means copying? At, in, at some point it was copying me. Yes. But no, I have to accept it. This is a genre of tattooing. No it's, point. John, or I definitely do see, like, I see a lot of, I won't say it's a lot, but I definitely have seen tattoos that are done in a style similar, but it doesn't look quite right. Right, like you see it, and you're like, I know who this is supposed to be, but it's not. Like it has a very distinct look. It's like yeah, black I mean, work with big. I mean, it's a genre of tattooing. Yeah, there's like, <laughs> like back in the time, there was Sadly Head start making dot work, but it, people not co copy him. It's a genre, you know. And there are people in the genre who make the genre better, and some who make it worse. Yeah, it always has to start somewhere, right? Like someone has to be the first person to do something and then you said... Yeah, and at some point you're in a place, you know, it was never my intention, you know? And and I tried in the beginning to be very mad of the people copying it. True, it was me. It was my stuff. And at some point you have to accept you can't stop it anyway. No, it's going to be a runaway train for sure. I, I, I like the people who, who are more respectful visit and make a little research and be a little bit more respectful with it than the people who just want to be tough and give a shit, you know? Mm -hmm. But under the line, it's a genre and you can't stop it. No, it, and especially if it becomes popular and it's just people are going to want to profit off of it, right? So, Yeah, there are a lot of people want to profit, but we had crazy stories, you know? People got tattooed here, start tattooing, tell other people they learned it here. We had people they got tattooed here, they tell... Other people, they don't know from us. It's their style. Like, you know. Yeah. And we've seen screenshots and documentation and stuff from it. And at some point we say, I know really like I give a shit. I'm not a tattoo artist anymore. I'm not Liz Vasica. I give a shit actually, you know. Like, know a lot. My my apprentice, sometimes there's someone new makes like really unrespectful, weird copies. Like very one-to-one -one from pieces. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, you know, I let this go. I let go from being a tattooist because it's not in my mindset anymore. And it feels good. Where, it was a different... Uh, where do you see it? What do you see yourself doing in 10 years from now? I know you're Traveling around now. the world in my camper van. Yeah. <laughs> it's, that's will that that's be, chapter three, yo. <laughs> yeah. I, I see your, your content now with the marathons and, and the different challenges and stuff on YouTube. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's nothing else, you know, than pushing the human potential mm -hmm. Yeah, I, in a different way. I see all of that stuff in a very similar way to, to extreme tattooing. It's still pushing limits and yeah, it's pushing limits experiential and may, may, maybe hit quick back to the social media thing. You know, for me back then to shut it fully down was very freeing. Yeah. Because also to understand you, you're in a place you influence. It's not just people see your stuff. You, that's what I mean. I was very careful with stuff I released. When I make the third dimension was the 10 people piece. Mm -hmm. It was nine months after we done it. I released it. Yeah, we it was very famous. Some, because I had to share some sketches before to find the peoples. And I shared, I think two pictures from like, you just see the mayhem. And people seen it happen. It really happened. Yeah. But that's it. And then I shut down. And I, I didn't give, I, I, I didn't give the picture to anyone. The people who was here, it was a team of 14 people. We used, we, we made this tattoo. And there was this 14 people seen the tattoo live. This 14 people seen the final picture. I printed the final picture. And I, I was, Printed them out for everyone one cheat. So I printed 14 pieces out and everybody signed every piece. Then I took the 14 pieces and I told them that whenever I release, I will send them the original print with all the signs from the people. Yeah. But I wanted to be in control. 
and that it what means leak, but like you know how it happens. You send it to a friend, a friend show it to another friend, and it's in the internet. And I showed it to a few friends live. I not send it to anyone. And I watched at this and I was so scared what it does with the world to release a piece like this, you know? Yeah. Be because at this point I made like 15 double back pieces. I made pieces with three peoples, pieces with four peoples. I made a lot of bodysuits and I gained a lot of knowledge about all of this to push it to a point to make this. It took me 11 months And all the experience before with all that stuff. And then 11 full dedicated months to make this piece. Where I every day think about it, plan it, the logistic behind, the safety behind, the healing, the, the full how you bring all of these people into this ritual, mm -hmm. into the mindset behind. It was 11 months to make this. Getting and, one person to do a bodysuit and doing it the whole way through is hard enough, let alone that many. So I don't think anyone's ever going to top that. I'm not worried about the 15th. Are you? Yes, are you, you know, but that? that's why it was also very strategic. I make the four pieces, and I was knowing first of all I had the, I after I done the four pieces, the love tattoo. I drive home. I, I basically I made a I made a lot of double bags. Then I make the three pieces. Yeah. And then I was like, I want to do with four. I published a post that I need four peoples who come together for a piece, no matter where in the world, I will come there and make it. And I don't want money. Point. And it took me like two days to find the people. We video called one month later, we make the piece. Mm. I canceled everything I had in my calendar. I drive to Italy. I bring two tattoo spots with me and I make this happen because I wanted to make this happen. And I give a shit about everything else around in my world. And I drive home from this. I remember that moment, you know, and I had this peace in myself, like this is it. This is the maximum for me as a tattoo artist. I found my peace. And then I was like, but you know, what is when I just, like an architect, don't build the house? Yeah. What is when I just, I know a lot of good tattoo artists, when I ask some friends helping me to make a piece, you know, what is the limit then? Do you think that's the limit or do you think anyone else can no, go farther? No, I I planned uh, like a piece way bigger than this. Yeah. How big were you thinking? Like it was around um, 40 peoples. Why didn't it happen? I already had some sponsors also for the hall because that we at the point of the logistic of the peoples also, you know? Yeah. Because you need a hall for this. You need like, you need like cater catering. You need like. Oh, yeah host the peoples, it's getting to a point, it's crazy, you know, you have 10 tattoo artists, 40 peoples, and then you need like around 15 peoples as a team around this. So you, we, we speak about 55 peoples for a tattoo. It's a point of logistic who gets so crazy, it would take me years to make this happen. A lot of money, a lot of stuff around the tattooing. It will be like three days of tattooing, but one year of dedicated planning. Yeah. And for me, as an artist, which art is like, you, you, you try to push something to a place where probably no one goes. That is my intent as an artist, sure. And I, I think the third dimension does the job. I don't think, I don't know what reaction you had when you see that piece the first time. But I think when I would have made a piece bigger than this, you would not have the same reaction. You would just think, Oh, he made another big piece. Yeah, of course. And also there's there's something lost in translation to the average consumer. They don't understand the logistics that goes into yeah, something like you, that. Yeah, but you get this point. It's like you will not have like this. When I make the third dimension, the world seen this. This was like, what the fuck? There, you but I would make shark. a bigger piece. It wouldn't be. It would just me making a bigger piece. Because then it's like, what's the next one going to be? 400 people? Like you always yeah, have just, to chase the dragon. It would be, you know, it sounds very crazy, but it felt for me as an artist, it would be just repeating. Yeah. Because course. it's it would be about who makes the bigger piece. Mm -hmm. Not was about this, you know. I think the the 10 people is that big enough that no one ever will attempt this. Because he 
really not have the experience to even to figure out how to do this. Yeah. To really make one piece on 10 people, not just tattoo 10 people. Yeah, I completely understand what you mean. It would be, it gets redundant after a while. It's like, yeah, yeah, what else can you do? People get bored and they, they don't understand the complexity and they've already seen that and it's it, beca- it loses value the more you do it. Even if and it I, gets- I think the the four peoples, you know, you would, there may be some peoples would have to attempt to make them five peoples. Yeah. And they would probably ruin five back pieces and um, <laughs> done a lot of harm on the bodies, yeah. like on the minds of the peoples, because they not go through the experience to make a lot of double pieces and like learn how to make sessions with multiple persons and the process behind. And so I think this piece is so big that people don't even think about going that far, you know? No, uh, there's there's more to it than just the actual work that goes into it for sure. But um, I did want to bring up one more thing. Uh, I mentioned that I... I had mentioned the Lucky Diamond Rich on my Reacts video, and I've actually recently done one on him. Um, the only reason why I'm bringing him up here is um, he has been known as the world's most tattooed person, but I would claim that you might have done more, more potential coverage. Um, I think I've probably been tattooed for more hours than him, but not as much coverage. Uh, what do you feel about titles? Do you care about titles? Yeah, I don't care about titles, obviously, you know. So, so this this leads into my next point. Would you be happier with no one knowing about the work you've done? The, the thing is, like, I, I don't care, you know. It's like, also, when, when you follow me you now on my channel or the stuff I produce, I barely talk about myself in the no, way I about how I look, you know. Yeah. And... In the beginning, a lot of people ask me, no, not so much people ask me anymore, but they accept like I'm just, just the one I am. I look different, yes, because I have a different past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I look like I look because I was little swastika in my first chapter. So that's point, that's it. But I'm not anymore, so I don't need to talk about, you know. I talk about me as a person, no. And me as a person, no, I barely get tattooed. I get like tattoos like this size, you know, once every two months. That's it. Mm-hmm. Like nothing to talk about. Do you think you could ever find the love for it again? Yeah, the, the thing is, I, you know, time is such a value thing. And I really optimize. I sleep yearly. I like be very creative and productive. And I have so much stuff to do in my life. I don't know when to do that. I and I pushed that one chapter so far. I, I pushed that 16 years. I made nothing else. It was one trip, one mindset. It was me going into being this and going out being this, you know? It's like when you go in a really crazy ritual, at some, you, you try to go as far as you can till you tap out. I tapped out. There's no harm in it. That was my... And I'm not like... I don't like to repeat myself. Mm. That's it, you know. So it's just I, the one time things. I do something, I do it right. I not I'm not the person I try to attempt something and say I make it the next time better. Mm-hmm. I do it with 150% I have in the first try. And I see this as a one thing, you know, this this was my my ritual as a tattooist. This be- getting tattoo with everything, you know, this was me. This was the chapter little swastika. And it's hard to explain to the peoples because most peoples never gone that far in a journey. Or they like, you You want to become successful, you want to become famous, whatever, you know. But to understand the hardest thing in that chapter for me was to tap out. That was the I can imagine. craziest thing I done as Little Swastika. And this is my machine. It's I destroyed it. This was the one machine I used for everything. It was I was no, I want to destroy the machine. I want to destroy me, but I want to see it. I have it stand here close to me because here I spent most a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. It's it's nothing. It's forgotten, you know. It was a Good one, you know, it was a great ritual, a great experience, a great chapter. 
And I'm way more excited to see what the next chapter brings mm -hmm. than to repeat myself. I don't I like to go that. backwards. Because I think so many people are afraid of regret and, and they live a lot in the past and they would assume that covering up or changing your identity or something is like a sign that you're not happy with what you did in, in your past or that you're trying to hide or run from it or something. But but that that's not me saying that. I'm saying people have made that assumption of me as well, where it's like, uh, I don't want my old life or I don't want to be who I was. And so I'm trying to do something else to escape that. But I think it's more like um, all of that was great, but now I'm on to the next thing. You know, it's, it's not about... It's very simple to put in word, you know, in one... I, I love the philosophic aspect of this lifestyle and the benefits you gather from an alternative lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're tattooed or not. This is not what an alternative lifestyle makes to me, you know. I I grew up in subcultures to realize that every subculture is just another society with having his own laws and rules and stuff, you know. I don't like the idea. I like the idea of a free individualism person living a life dedicated by himself and dictated by himself. Sure, with no harm to other peoples, but that's what I mean. I not harm anyone, you know, I'm just living my life. Um, for me, I go through this journey to let go from society, you know, and I not say, I never was say, to make this very clear, that I live outside of society. We all part of society and I understand my role in society very early on that I will always be part of society. I will never be free. I don't believe in freedom. I, be, I think we live in a world we captured in a cell of society and it's our part how we deal with it, you know? Mm. I, for myself, I paint my cell. I understand my cell and I find my peace within this and my happiness. And I 100% believe in the benefit of this, for me, looking like I was, was a very radical step to punch my own face, to remind myself on a daily basis that I don't want to be one of these punk guys who at some point get a good offer for a job and put his clothes down and live a normal life. This was a statement to myself. And I know it comes to the point that because I'm still, I, no, I'm, I, I, I'm, I still like, I like philosophy. I read a lot of philosophy in my early days mm -hmm. to the point that I didn't anymore because I understand philosophy is how you live. It's not what you read and what you want to be. It's, there's no rule in it, you know? And I also wrote a book, you know, and my book is very weird, I would say. And it's not an intention to guide someone, but it's just the intention. It's just showing my reality of life because a lot of people say it's so far off from reality or from how the world works. It's, it's not as easy as to say, you know, because I, I can tell you what's real and what's not, you know, there's a lot of theories and stuff. And I, I'm not really believe in any of this. I just believe in the poor experience of stuff and living in the know, but giving your life to something you're not hundred percent behind. It's probably the most horrible thing you can do in life. I so think it's most people do that. On the, on the line of society, when you don't want to, is a bad thing. And I think everybody would benefit from letting go. And a lot of people, you know, everybody was my entire life say, I had talent, I had luck. And I can tell you, I don't. I, I got kicked off with 15. Luck. I had no talent, no luck, no money, no nothing. Everything I ever made, I earned myself because I was radical, dedicated mm. this. I was make no compromises. And people think it's hard to let go from a job they don't like. I let go from being little swastika. I let go from a, like a life. It was out of my wildest dreams I ever had. I made, I meet amazing peoples. I could make 100% free my art, what I wanted on cool peoples whenever I wanted. I made good money. I lived a good life. I let go from this, you know, and I think the next chapter now, this is my dedication to 
trying to, what means inspire people's maybe in a better way, in a different way, in to show, man, whatever you wanted to do it. And it doesn't matter who you are before and who you are after, you know, it's about living the days. And for me, it's not only a proof to others. It's also a proof to myself mm. that I can be everything what I want. And main overall, I like the idea to show to my daughter that you can become everything you want to become. And I don't like this parents tell their kids what they can do. I don't. I show my kid what you, what I can do. And I, you know, she knows what I done as a tattooist because now she get in the age and she understand more what was going on there. And she start asking more also other people's, but I like the idea to start something completely unrelated to this, something new, mm. which is another big passion of mine and see how far I can push it. Yeah. So it's a, a very philosophical thing for me to start a new chapter. My, uh, one of my big inspirations has been showing my son similar that you can do it your own way. You don't have to do it the way that most people say you have to do it. You can go an alternative path. Um, because my son is, uh, he's coming up on 14 years old now and where I live, it's commonly believed that if you look like even what I do, you're not going to be doing anything. And, uh, I've showed him that that's not true and he doesn't necessarily have to follow my path, but I want him to see that he can do what he wants and be successful. So that's been a huge motivator for me. Um, on the topic of you, you wanted to prove to yourself that this was, right or that this was for you or that you could do this i was in a similar kind of place when i first did got my first face tattoo of i was online thinking like i could just take out my piercings i could just not get many more tattoos i could try and just live a normal life and and get a a, a good paying job and just be part of the system but i think i'd always regret that i think i'd always be thinking that i gave up a big part of myself to do that And I, I think it was a really good thing and it was a really important thing for me to stamp myself with some kind of a mark that was going to almost force me into the lifestyle I'd already been living. Like it was already something I'd been a part of for a long time and tattooing my face was like, okay, now you're staring at it every day. Like now you're living with your consequences. And it was, it was a make or break moment for me, I feel like. Did you have a similar feeling like that at any point? 18, getting the first something on my fingers and it was very small. Mm -hmm. It was like feel free on my fingers. And I already got a lot of tattoos back then. Quite, you know, some of my arms and stuff and on my chest and legs. And it was just this little reminder that like I put my feeling of like, you know, like this, I want to feel free. I not, I know I don't will be free, but I want to feel free. And I know whatever happens, I won't not be judged on how I look and how I behave in the normal society aspects. And this was like a reminder to myself. Mm -hmm. And back in that time, it's so long ago, people freaked out. And I was back then, I was a gardener, you know, a gardener. And I had this very small script on my fingers. And people freaked out and say, I will never, ever find a job anymore. These days, like, that's like a no-brainer. You will, no one gives a shit yeah. as a gardener. Yeah. <laughs> But back then, it, this was a real statement. And it, I know it was a real statement. And I know I ruined my life. But uh, it wasn't. I, I ruined my normal society life. Yes. This was with intention. Mm -hmm. And it was a very deep, important, meaningful step for me in that journey. Yeah. Because I was knowing I don't want this life. And that I better die and kill myself before I live a fucking normal life. This was a statement to myself. And what would happen? You can say, like, I was not afraid to kill myself. No, I was not afraid to live. What would happen theoretically if everyone did that? Do you think the world would be? No, it wouldn't work. Like, like, you know, that's like the, the thing about me as a philosopher releasing a book and like share a lot of my thoughts. It's a non-conceptual thinking of how the world would work. I don't think 
there's any way this amount of people in the world would work. Point. Mm -hmm. Me, as a philosopher, who think what would make the world a better place would be to kill all humans. Yeah. This would make yeah. the world a better place. Point. <laughs> When there would be a button I press and all humans die, I 100% guarantee you I would press it. Yeah, the, the whole idea of That's the humans. only way we humans could save the earth. Mm. Point. I don't believe... I think we need this kind of society thing that the humans could work together. Because when there would be some sort of a free living structure like anarchy or whatever, people would kill themselves. People would like go mad. There would be always... It only needs one very bad person or someone with a bad intention and it would flip the game. Because then the next one's revenge and you know, we know the game. So sure, it needs some authority, we we'll take care and here we are. I think I'm lucky that I'm born in Western society and have the chances we have. And that's also what I think a lot of people, they say, I'm scared of this, scared of this. And when I don't have a job, like, man, you, you like, you know, when you're poor here, when you have nothing in your life, you have more than 80% of the peoples in the world. So what's your fucking problem? Huh? What are you scared of? I think people are spoiled for choice. And uh, it's almost like we have too many options, too many good options. To, when you have less good options, you pick the first good option. Now it's... I think people are paralyzed with choice. Like you yeah, have everything people would at your benefit fingertips. from from shutting down something, you know. I I love to live a minimalistic life, you know. Yeah. It's very funny kind of because I have here Psyland and we I own two houses and there's a lot of stuff, you know, but what was all necessary for making this happen? And then a lot of people see this and think, "Wow." Now like, yeah, I saved money since I'm 20 years old to make a project like this happen, mm -hmm. to make a real alternative something, you know? And I, since one year, we live in a tent, me and my wife. We sleep in a tent in the winter, you know? We made already the first winter in a tent while we own two houses. And you think, what makes that for sense? And we at a point, we, we, we never will move in a house anymore, you know, because we benefit from this, because it feels awesome. And sure, like, We have nights we sleep with minus five under two blankets with clothing. But it makes us more happy. It values life so much more. You not take everything as granted. And this always searching for the next expensive item, the next materialistic thing, the next whatever, you know. Man, when it's minus five and I make a fire in the morning for my wife, she has the biggest smile. Yeah. When you have to wake her up with... With plus 10, you know? Yeah. And, you know, when you minimalize the down life, it's so hard to, all these people will pray all this stuff, you know? It's not about this. It's when you experience that yourself, you change. And you feel you become more happy. I feel more happiness the, the lower we go, you know? When I was last, like two months ago, I, go, I was go alone one month to Ireland. I run every day. And I sleep under a rain poncho in the craziest weather I've ever experienced in my life. But that's why I was going to Ireland. Mm. And I come back after one month sleeping on the wet ground in the storm under a rain poncho with very little clothing because I was run every day and I had to carry everything. And I come back in my tent here. And I felt like a king. <laughs> like, wow, I have walls protecting me from... The, the nature, you know? Yeah. And it's so ridiculous, you know? Like, people like, oh, you can sleep in a tent. I come there. I was crying from feeling that luxury, you know? And I just love it. It's awesome, you know? And it's stuff everybody can do, you know? I'm a lot into fasting and, like, taking stuff out of my life instead of, say, I give myself another luxury, I take away a luxury for a month. Like drinking coffee, eating food, like really fundamental stuff. And man, and then you go back to it, that feels more luxury than when you add whatever luxury it is. Mm. Yeah, I've had a bit of that. Um, even just minor things like when you cut your tongue, when you split your tongue or you get your fingers blacked out or something and you just can't 
do certain things for a week. And then when you can again, it's a sudden realization of just how how good you had it. You know, it's I'm sure anything you take away from yourself, you'll appreciate it more when you have it back. But a lot of people aren't willing to make those kinds of uh, those kinds of cons- what, what do I what would I call it sacrifices even for a moment. You know, yeah, I mean that's that's the point where most people fail. And in my eyes, you know, the problem is there are a lot of people that are cowards. The cowards of life, because they already scared to make small sacrifices. Yeah. But when you want to live a life you dream from, you have to sacrifice a lot more. Yeah, like a lot more. But it's it's very hard f- for people to get to that. I don't know what it like. I agree with you that I don't think you were lucky. I said in my reaction to you that I think you're a very gifted person. I still do believe that. You can't make me not believe that, but I don't think you were lucky. I think you were a hard worker. I think you've got a strong will. Uh, how do you build willpower into someone? Yeah, but that's the thing. It's with little steps, you know? Yeah. It's with the fucking little steps. And that's to understand, to go out of your way once a day. That's the little steps. For me, like the one, one of the main things I have to a lot of people which I meet in person, And I say, you know, take smoking. Smoking is the very first thing. You want a better life? Stop smoking. Yeah. Because, first of all, you get more healthy. Okay. But take that time. When you Let's say you have a hobby. Let's say it's painting. You would take that like 10 times a day you smoke five minutes a cigarette. It's 50 minutes. So take that time and paint 50 minutes every day. And no, the money you save, you take this money and put it, invest it into painting. And then see what happens in one year. We're starting even smaller. A lot of what I see with people here is they're scrolling through their social media for hours, like laying in bed, watching TV, eating chips, and smoking pot or drinking, and scrolling through social media for hours. Yeah, it's the sacrifices. You don't bring in the sacrifices of little (laughs) things, you know? Like, that's the point, you know? Let's say you have a problem with that. Take your phone. Say that's the two hours of the day. I hide my phone. Yeah. yeah. There are apps you can like. The apps don't allow you to go on anything on the phone for a few days. And then you put in a passport. You give this to a friend. That's commitment, you know. But like that's what I mean. They cowards. Hmm. They maybe want to change something, but they cowards to really change something. That's the thing. Everybody want a better life. Everybody want change. Yeah. And But no one does it, you know? And that's the big difference. Because when you really want to do something, you do. When you really want to stop smoking, you do. Because every smoker says he want to stop. He tried. No, you don't. When you tried, no, you stop. I agree. When, whenever, I've, whenever I've wanted to do something, I would do it. If, I, if ever I didn't yeah, do it. But that's the willpower, you know? Yeah. The thing is, You really want to do something or you think you want to do something. Yeah, yeah I always said. And well, that's a big difference. That's what I mean. You not want to change. You you think you want to change because everybody wants to change and everything wants something better. But actually, you're okay with your life like this. You're okay with going to work eight hours a day for someone else for very little money and then come home, watch television and take drugs. Yeah. You're okay the last five years and you will be okay the next 40 years. But then accept it. Be honest to yourself. Hmm. I don't think people are okay, okay you with know? that. Like, I don't think people want to be honest with themselves. That people have a lot of uh, lies that they have to maintain in order to keep their identity in check. It's a really weird thing to see. Um, a lot of people can't sit in silence. Like, even here, I see people need music or TV on in the background to drown out even their own thoughts, because I think it would kill them to be alone with themselves for 20 minutes. You yeah, know? I mean, that's, that's we go into a way more deep psychology of humans. It's like a lot of people are like afraid of themselves, I think, you know, because they're not happy. They know somewhere deep in them. But this is the stuff they want to change. They're not able to change because they're scared to change. But maybe they not really want to change. But as they are not honest to themselves, they're not really reflected with themselves. It's almost like they don't have an understanding of themselves. So that's why a constant distraction of life mm-hmm. makes them less think, you know. 
And the thing is, people are scared of their own thoughts because maybe that leads them to something they're not happy with. That's why this lifestyle, the normal people, the normal society is built for this lifestyle because normal society is not a really happy place. It's not supposed to be a happy place. But it's the only place where it kind of works that that amount of people, some sort of live together. And so it's a constant loop of the peoples. And I think the very first thing is peoples would need to learn to be happy with themselves in their own thoughts. They talk from everything. I'm 100% sure they would find more happiness. But also their happiness would probably lead to a lot more radical decisions in life. It would, and I think that that's a big part of why the, the whole system that's built around uh, the world that we're living in, for the most part, is designed to keep us in those systems. It's designed to keep us distracted, and we're working on better, we're working on better ads, and our algorithms are finding things that we like for us. When we open our phone, it's immediately something that it knows we want to see, It's just distraction after distraction, and it keeps us from a place where we can very, very easily find what would be better. It's just a constant kind of loop, and they're getting yeah. better and better at keeping people there. I mean, that is so, that is society, you know. What, what do you think? Why is alcohol, weed, cigarettes legal and psychedelics illegal? Yeah, that's Point. the biggest crazy thing for me because, well, then again, psychedelics would help people break free. Because if you can have a really good, uh, a really good, strong mushroom trip in the right circumstances, you can do some real work. Yeah, that's. But that's <laughs> why by, that I, would I harm society, you know. Because when people see more what's going on, yeah. and everybody would individually find a better, nicer path for himself. Yeah, yeah. Psychedelic it intervention wouldn't work. would really only. That's change. why drugs would maybe harm a lot more the body, harm the health, kill people, do horrible stuff. They're still legal. Because they shut down the peoples. Mm -hmm. So simple explained, you know? Yeah, I think uh, heavy psychedelic intervention on a large scale would reform the world to some degree. But I don't know what that would look like if everyone was more awake than they are now. Yeah, but I mean, we go to a point, you use heavy psychedelics, you will never use them on daily basis. First, no. of the tolerance rise up uh, for the body, you will never. You just don't. They're not... They're not um, addictive. They like not harm your body, but they are so strong from the experience. You always need a process time. Yeah. And like, you know, also on this, I was really pushing it far. <laughs> And I have to say, I am, I come from a very, with 18, I start um, letting go from any kind of drugs. I was living a very crazy straight edge life. Mm. And um, I come to psychedelics over shamanic rituals. And for me, I not, I'm not pro of using psychedelics in a form as drugs. Yeah, I know what you mean. You don't do it as a fun time and how to get yeah, high. I think the, 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 everyone in the right circumstances, in the right setting, in the right time of life with a right purpose would benefit from this, you know? Yeah, I completely agree. I'm, I've never been one to drink, smoke, or do casual drugs, but a few times in my life, real good mushroom trip has helped me clear some things up. Like it's it's never to get high and sit around and giggle and and you know sh shoot the shit with friends. It's it's like you really you strip your ego away and you see what's at the core. Almost you barely remember your name even sometimes. Where it's like, oh, this is all different than I've been thinking it was. Yeah, it's going deep in conscious. But as people are already scared of their own conscious, they even more scared of the deep conscious. Yeah. It's but sad. yeah, I mean that. But that's point. That's why it's illegal and why, like stupid drugs, who just make people numb and dumb, they're illegal. Yeah. You can buy everywhere. No, no, like all when this this this, this COVID stuff happened, you know. Then you see the numbers and you're like, come on, there's like, like I don't know, in a year, eight million people die from cigarettes. Yeah, eight million, and like you buy them everywhere. Yeah, they're everywhere. But then like half a million of people die from COVID and they shut down the world. You kidding me? Yeah. And people are really thinking it's about health? We pick and choose what we care about, for sure. But I will say in Canada, we're doing quite a bit of testing with psilocybin and therapy now. I don't know how long it will be before that becomes completely legalized here, but I don't know. I don't know that it's good that it does. 
Uh, I would almost prefer it doesn't. You know, I, I think that it's once you start using it in a way that that the system is OK with, it will be regulated to a point where you can't have the heavy breakthroughs as easily. That's what it is. Yeah. Uh, it's getting pretty late into this. Here it's probably around midnight. I don't even know how long we've been talking. <laughs> Two hours and six minutes. Two hours and six minutes. That's not bad. Yeah, I would like to do this again sometime, but um, I have some other things I'd like to talk about, but perhaps another time. So we might do a part two to this if you'd be okay with that. Yeah, sure. Why not? I I've enjoyed this conversation anyway.